the numbers are quite large, so we should kind of uh, get an idea of, of how big our y axis should be. We go down to negative 35, we go up as high as 43. Okay, so uh, maybe by tens. <coughs> so these are each worth one, these are each 10. We'll start at zero. Zero, negative 35. So here's negative 30, negative 35 is right there. Uh, one, negative 33. Uh, there's negative 33, right there. Uh, two, negative nine. Almost negative 10. Uh, 343. Right there. Over to the negative, negative one, negative 21. Negative two, three, and negative three, thirty-one. So there are some points, and we can graph them, right? We can connect them. What kind of a shape should we make as we connect these? Triangle, just bing like that sharp corner right there. Really common to do that, but graphs don't have to be straight lines between the points, right? We just got done graphing parabolas, parabolas with these nice <coughs> curves, right? So connect them first from left to right, right? We gotta go through all these points. Let me show you what'll happen if I miss one of these points. Come down through here, I'll miss that point and go through this one. I know my graph does have to go through that point, so how am I going to get my, my graph to go through that point? I have to like come back this way, wouldn't I? If I want, if I on purpose missed that, not just that I drew it poorly, but I just completely missed that, to come back somehow and grab that point, right? That's not gonna make much sense, right? Uh, if I draw it like this, is this a function then? Remember that special condition about functions? Have input and output. What's that other small def part of the definition of a function? One input, two, one output. One input, one output. Okay. So right here, output, output, two outputs. Okay. So that's why we need to make sure that as we go from left to right, go through all the points that we've drawn. Let's back it up. Let's go through these points and make as smooth a curve as possible. So those are the points that we found, we found so far. I think that's it. Should we do anything more? Are we done dra drawing this graph? Mm -hmm. We have to show what the rest of it's kind of gonna do, right? Gonna look like. So is it safe enough just to go like this? Just like that? Maybe. And maybe not. Okay. That's what parabolas look like, right? Um, but you might notice there's, there's not really any symmetry to this in the way that parabolas have symmetry. It's different than a uh, parabola in that way. But that's the, that's the question we're asking. That's what we want to know. This is what's called end behavior. When we get far, far to the right and far, far to the left, what will it do? Will, will this side go up this way or will it go up in that direction? Okay. Here's another way. Let me go back a little bit. Here's another way of asking that question. So if we continue this table in this direction and finding outputs, which is the same as like what's the graph going to do, so if we go in this direction, I want you to think about this. Make a guess. If we were to continue this table, continue the x values out in this direction, what kind of y values would we get? Would we continue to get larger and larger and larger ones? Or at some point would we get smaller and smaller and smaller? I want you to think about it for a sec. 
these are chain spinners. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and not only do I want you to think about it and make a guess, I want you to make an educated guess. So I want you to be able to defend your guess. Okay, so um, put some thought into it. So it's like a guess more than a conclusion. Yeah, you know, draw a conclusion. Make an educated guess. So based on some kind of an evidence, um, decide what you think. Um, it's not exactly random, but the, it's not easy to like, just go like up and over like you would with a line or something like that, right? Like there's no really slope to it. So <clears throat> the exact values are, it would be hard to say. But would the values continue to get larger and larger and larger in the positive direction? Or might we see them start to come back down? So I mean they were uh, positive here, came back into the negatives and went positive, will they come back and be negative? Will they, if we go this way, is it going to come back into the negative or just keep on going and being more positive? And if so, why do you think that? They'll keep getting bigger in the y direction because over there you have positive x to the fifth. Like x to the third and x to the second, so x to the fifth. Why do you just have one negative? Wait, is this, is this x to the fifth? No. But you have a lot more positive x than negative x. So here's a positive x cubed. It's going to be rather large if x is a big number, right? If you cube 100, that's a big number. Uh, square 100, also quite large. And then minus 700, right? Just picking a random number for x, 100. Well, when you got a million here from doing uh, 10 cubed, and you got 80,000 for doing uh, 100 squared, and you subtract 700, that's not going to be very, uh, not a very big deal. Yeah? I said the same thing as Gordon's. Okay. They keep getting bigger, and also the reason it changed in the negatives is because the negative numbers have the potential to become positive numbers because they're squared in the equation. So, so, like, if you put negative 3 in for x, uh -huh. it, would be, it would become a positive number. When you square it? When you square it. Okay, that's, those are good observations. Those are really important observations to make. So when we square things, uh, or even if we take them to an even power, they're going to be still positive. Even positive or negative, whatever you plug in for x, if you take it to an even power, it'll be positive. But when you put a negative in for a cube, or any other odd power, you'll end up getting a negative. So, so what it seems like is uh, when these numbers are kind of smallish, Right? One, zero, negative one. This cube isn't so big anymore. Right? And this seven is quite big. Does that make sense? Okay? So we do have the, the potential to dip down into the negatives for a bit. Right? Okay. And then well after that as uh, as we kind of piece together, if we keep putting big positive numbers in here, big, big positive number, big positive number, negative, but not nearly as big in magnitude as these things, okay? <coughs> so our guess is if we keep going in this direction, you know, if x goes to infinity, right? That's a, a way we can say that. It's, a, it's the math way we do say it. Uh, as x goes to infinity, g of x is going to go toward what? Positive infinity. Also positive infinity. It will also become Okay, so I won't give it away, but it's already been said, a really, really important point here. Um, what if, like the key to answering this question has already been put out there. If we go in this direction, which means our x's are going to go towards some big negative numbers, then what will y do? Stay negative. The what? Stay negative. The y values that we get will be negative? Okay, why do you conclude that? Okay, so you just feel like it would be the opposite for some reason? Okay. Gordon? Eventually moving in the negative direction, the x cubed, like you got times a thousand cubed, is going to have way, <coughs> be way bigger than x squared times 8. The 8 is inconsequential. 
you guys agree? Eight's kind of a big number. It'd be bigger than negative seven times a thousand. It'd be bigger than negative seven times a thousand if it was a thousand in there? If you put a thousand in X, uh, a thousand times negative thousand squared would be more than negative seven times a thousand. That's, yeah, that seems to, to make sense, right? If you put negative a thousand in there, that'll be a thousand squared. Right, it'll be positive because it's it's squared. And multiply by eight. That's very big. That's much bigger than negative seven times x, which would be negative a thousand. So negative seven thousand times negative thousand. So actually, a uh, positive seven thousand. Okay. Play. But that sounds like a really big positive number. Yeah. yeah. I think that the number needs to be positive. My values. If we went that way, we'd stay positive. If you put negative numbers in for x. Yeah. Then we we just keep going positive. Yeah. Because Okay, so you can count uh, so for negative numbers. This part, this part will always be positive. This part will always be positive. But if the negative values are just getting bigger, then then these are just going to be getting bigger, bigger, right? And okay. all, all you have is thirty-five. I just you got minus thirty-five. The x cubed will be pretty big, but pretty big. I think that the middle will still be. So you got these two middle things that will always be positive, and then you got just this small, small negative, and this will be negative. But you have these two positive things which are quite large. Yeah? Um, I think it'll go positive for a little while and then it'll go, it'll start going back down. Why is that? Because x cubed is negative and it would, at some point it'll override the other two. You think so? I think. So. Even though those two, I mean it's squared, that's pretty big. And, and x, that's also going to be rather big and they're both positive. What are you doing over there? Are you cheating? I was going to say that if we plug negative 1,000 in there, we get nine, negative 992,007,035. Okay, well, ooh, that sounds big. Assuming that you did this correctly. I took negative 1,000 times uh, negative 1,000 times negative 1,000, and then took negative 1,000 times negative 1,000. Well, we know what you're supposed to do. Yeah, I get I, that. So, but assuming you didn't make some small mistake, you got negative 9 million something? Oh, we're almost into it. The billions. Maybe 192 million. Almost in the billions. Okay, so if you trust Gordon's calculating abilities on his calculator, he's saying there's way, way <laughs> negative. Are you shaking your head? Yeah, shaking my head. Um, okay. Did you have a question? Did you have something? No, I was agreeing with Reese. It's got to be negative. It's got to be. Why is it? It's got to be for the same reasons that Reese said? Yeah. Okay, so it's not, like cube is, is much more powerful, right? If, you, if I gave you the option of cubing your money or, or, or squaring your money. Isn't when it's the same number, it's times itself three times, or yeah. it's like times eight three times? If it's a thousand, it's a thousand times itself three times, but it's times eight three. Right, so there's like three numbers, is kind of what you're saying, right? So here, a thousand, negative a thousand. In there is negative a thousand times negative a thousand times negative a thousand. But well, this is negative a thousand times negative a thousand times eight. Yeah. Right? That third number is an eight. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to look at it. Right? So, like if we got to, to uh, negative eight, right? negative eight times negative eight times negative eight, pretty big. This would be negative eight times negative eight times positive eight. So that would actually be exact opposites, wouldn't they? Right? So they would be exactly canceling each other out. But once we get past negative eight to negative nine, this would be negative nine times negative nine times negative nine. That'll be negative nine times negative nine times eight still, right? That third number is always an eight. So it's just a matter of finding, you so could theoretically make the zero if you found the exact number that cancel out the eight x squared minus seven x. Yeah, and in fact, there's a zero right there at some point. Like, everything is balanced out to zero, this one as well. And if we're to believe what uh, you and me said, Chance was saying it's got to come back down into the negative, so it would again cross into zero. But that would be it. Huh? It would just cross into three times. Three times. Three times. And by the way, that three, that's the most possible for this kind of, uh, for this degree. What degree is this? Third. Third. Third degree? Three possible times that it would cross the x axis. It's noteworthy. 
Does that always happen with 32? It won't always cross it three times, but the most it can do it is three times. How would it not cross three times? Well, let's look at this negative 35. When all is said and done, whatever we find here, we subtract 35, always subtract 35, okay? So if, say, we were to take away that 35, now we're not subtracting 35 from the y value, okay? Then all these y values would be 35 higher than they currently are. Does that make sense? Right now, you, you get to a y value, say it was uh, here, so if you and then you subtract 35, sends this y value all the way down here. So if we were to not subtract 35, but maybe add 5, Okay. But that would be 40 higher than what this is. This is at negative 35 right now. And it would be up in here. So it would look exactly the same. The curves would be exactly, exactly the same, except that they would be higher. Because we haven't subtracted 35, we actually added 5 to this whole thing. Okay. So if you had something to 7 to 3 across the x-axis, 7. Possible. Not a guarantee, but it's possible. So we're kind of starting to think that eventually we have got to get overpowered. The whole thing's got to be overpowered by this huge x cubed and be pulled into the negative. Okay? Uh, well, I have a treat for you. Okay? Um, wait, wait, wait. Will something to 4, 3 always cross the x-axis at least twice? No. Well, that's a good question. It um, I tried it with like a negative 15 and it yeah. actually was negative if I did it like that. Even if small, like negative 15 not being that big yeah, already in the negatives. Negative. Are you trying negative 14? So let me, yeah. um, I think I showed this class already, but might as well revisit it. This would be, let me clear this out, like in, in algebra 2, about now is where I would recommend if you have the money to spend on one getting a graphing calculator. Or there's, um, you can download this one off the internet for free. Um, the link is on my website. Um, there are free graphing calculators online. There's one called Desmos. You go to desmos.com, really super cool graphing calculator online. So we can check that out. Um, but it is nice one, nice to have one for your own, carry with you. Um, so if you've been thinking about buying one, I still I don't even require ca graphing calculators for my calculus class because it's just a lot of money and I don't think it's that necessary. But it is nice. I've had one since my junior year in high school. That's the same one that I got my junior year in high school, and it's I just use it all. That's my calculator. If I want to go to the grocery store and add stuff up, I'd rather have my graphing calculator than anything else. For one, I can just see you standing. I actually don't take it with me, but I feel more <laughs> comfortable with it because I use it all the time. But you can do a really long string of calculations on one line, just using parentheses and the order of operations like you would on a piece of paper. Um, also, it's got this function area, which is really useful. So what we can do is, uh, is put this in, did I show you this already? Or not? No. No? OK, so there's x cubed plus plus. 8x squared minus 7x minus 35. So the people who made this calculator made it so that it understands that x is this empty vessel. It's a variable that we can change the value of. So we can uh, look at the graph for one thing. Ooh, you can see the y scale is so like small. It's not as big as ours. Ours goes up to 50 and down to negative 40. And this only goes up to 10 and down to negative 10. So we'd have to switch that. That's not really what we care too much about right now. But you can see, if we could go up there, we would see that up, uh, coming down, going back up, just like we're theorizing. Okay? Um, so that's nice. Also, you can go into the table, and you can just enter values that you want. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and my table's back. Okay? And I recommend that you do this because you're having such a hard time doing it by hand that you think you, you can't. If you completed this table pretty well with very few mistakes, so you go ahead and move over to the calculator, save yourself some time. Okay. But there are times when you need to be able to do this stuff by hand and not get mixed up. 
So there we are, we got our values, that's how I filled in this table. Um, and so if we go and do negative 15, is that what you got, Jessica? Negative 15 or five? At negative nine. Yeah. Because at negative eight. So let's forget. There's negative nine. In, uh, here's negative eight. So negative eight, we have a positive, and negative nine, we have a negative. So it's somewhere between negative eight. Somewhere between there is, the, is yeah. where it crosses the x axis. Yeah? Cool. These are amazing. Probably a, that's a fantastic discussion. Um, okay, so somewhere between negative eight and negative mm -hmm. nine, that, it, does that? Does that make sense? We just kind of just talked about this. Does that make sense that it would be between negative eight and negative nine? No. Why is that? Oh, it kind of worked because like the eight would be somewhere where it would cancel out. Right, what, at negative eight, this would be negative whatever, and this would be the exact opposite. But then there's still this little bit over here that we have to overcome. So we should look at that. What's that? It would end up Yeah, there's negative 8, and it came out positive 21. And so you go a little bit past that to give that, that x cubed a little bit more room to push it down into the negatives. And once it does that, there's no coming back, because x cubed is so big. It's the point of no return. Exactly. So what I have for you, what I think is super neat. Uh, oh, there it is. So here we got this degree 3 polynomial, just like we looked at. Okay, It was uh, x cubed. It was plus eight. plus eight x, yeah. so I'm going to change that to an eight. I hope I can change it to an eight. Eight x squared minus seven minus seven x minus thirty-five. Oh, I don't think I can do thirty-five. No, I only went to here. Uh, So now I'll take it to negative 35. And there we have, we have the, uh, that polynomial. Do you see what these bars are representing? These vertical bars, these differently colored bars. Okay. What's that? The change of x at that stage. Sort of, yeah, depending on, on how you interpret what you mean by that stage. Uh, this is just the value of this term, this y. This, this, this actually this number right here is the y value of this term. Uh, this is the y value of this term. Like with x plugged in as one. Oh. That's the, the x is controlled by this slider here. Uh, so when x is one, this is the value of x cubed, eight x squared, eight x where x is uh, one. Uh, where x is one, we get negative seven, and well, negative thirty-five is just always going to be negative thirty-five. Right? So this blue bar represents that. Green bar represents the negative seven x. If I change it to zero, well, all of these, of course, would be worth zero. This would be worth negative 35. Okay. Now, what this is, is stacking all these, uh, you know, putting this on top of that one. So we'd add them together, we'd get nine. And then taking this one and putting it on top of that one so that we would subtract the seven and so on and so on. And it adds all that together and, and subtracts the 35. Okay. So if we go big enough, well, this, this bar is pretty big, and this bar isn't as big, but eventually, and I'm going to go over here again, as we noticed as we go to positive infinity, I'm going to shrink the y-axis down so we can see more of it. So we slide this over. Okay, the red bar is still, the, x, the 8x squared is still bigger, but that x cubed is gaining. And right there, no surprise at 8, they're balanced out. And this negative 7x, forget about it. It's so small that it can't really compete with the other two. Um, but once we go past 8, these two will be, well, this, the x cubed will be larger. And you can see that as we add all these things together, the x cubed, the 8x squared, uh, actually goes up to here, and we subtract um, 
the 7x, and then we subtract the 35, which brings us down to a final of 1279. Uh, I mean, it, it comes down a little bit, but the, the moral of the story here is that the values, the y values, are going up. They're going into positive infinity. And the more we take x to the positive infinity, the bigger that y value, that final y value gets. So we could do that forever and always have to shrink this down to see the next y value. So we stretch it back out, bring x back down to something like 1. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. If we take x into the negatives, well, that 8x squared is pretty big. Uh, and that the final y value, like 57, right, it's positive, still positive, still positive, but you can see that that pink rectangle is getting bigger and bigger as we move x into the negatives. Okay, and it's this blue guy that's the final value. And once we go from negative 8 to negative 9, let me just uh, show you just that final y value is negative 53. And the more negative we go now, the more negative the y value is going to be and never come back. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, let's go back here. <coughs> then as x approaches negative infinity, because this is what's happening if we go that direction, or in the graph go in that direction, well, then what's that? Well, let's do g of x, or y, same thing. Not equals, but goes toward, what does it go toward? Negative infinity. Beautiful. Oh. So if we put in big x values to the, you know, in the positive direction, we'll get these big positive y values. If we put in big negative uh, x's, we'll get it out big negative y values. Um, you think that's the only function that that's true for? Just these two things is what I'm talking about. That and that. That tendency on the right side and on the left side. You think that's the only function that does that? Probably not. Uh, what other functions? Talk about polynomials here. What other polynomials do you think? Like, could we make a category of polynomials that will do that? Um, ones that would like have, like on the first, on the like the leading. The degree, maybe. Yeah, like if the first degree that you have is higher, one higher than the second one. Just one difference from the next one. Okay. Um, then, so if we if we follow that, then let's cover that one up. Okay. So we're we're kind of having to ignore all this because this is specific to having an 8x squared in there. So the difference between the, the biggest power and the next one is, is the difference of 2. Do you think that'll change what happens as x gets to be very large? We could look. We can look on the, uh, the little sketch I made. We can make that, that term a 0 term. Take that guy to zero. Come on, there you go. So it's not there anymore. Let me stretch it back out. Let me bring back over here. All right. So here's this, this big old x cubed term. Then we're minus, minusing this, this measly 7x. I say measly when x is large enough. Um, do you think that as I let x get bigger and bigger and bigger that the y value is still going to get bigger and bigger positive? Or do you think it'll do something different? I think it's still going to get bigger and bigger. Still going to get bigger and bigger positive. Because by getting, getting rid of that 8x squared term, we've really, we just kind of slowed down the, the going positive process because we're not also adding on the 8x squared. But subtracting a 7x from an x cubed is not going to do much. Right? You can see, make it 26. x is 26. And I'm shrinking down the y-axis. 
having to do it quite a bit to be able to get up here. You can see just x cubed by itself is 17,576, and the final y value isn't all that much different. Right? So those other two terms just aren't doing a whole lot. Is that making sense? Or not? Yes. Okay. So what do you think? If you get rid of that 8x cubed, do you think it'll change what the y values will be? No. I mean, it'll change the actual values, but not the tendency for the y values to get really big in the positive direction. So the difference of the exponents to be 1 between the biggest one and the next one mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be 100% uh, predictive of this behavior. Well, let's, let's think about this. Can we agree that the x cubed is like the big, I mean, most influential term? Mm -hmm. It's what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the deciding, uh, we'll call it term, it's factor. Yeah. So uh, the deciding term, the one that, that really decides where we're going to go as a function, is this guy right here. It's huge. When x is, is not even that big, it was, what was it, like 14, the adding on this stuff hardly made a difference. Um, so if this guy is the one that determines it, what is it about that term that makes it go, you know, y values positive when x is positive and y values are negative when x is negative? Because when you cube a negative, it will be negative in the end. Uh -huh. And when you cube a positive, it will always be positive. Yeah, no matter what you do to a positive, cube it, square it, whatever, it's always going to be positive. You're just going to multiply positive a bunch of times. But when it's negative and you cube it, it comes out to be negative. And you cube it. Can you think of another power that would also come out negative when you took it to that power? Five. Five? Any others? Seven. So how about an odd power? An odd biggest power, or what's that biggest power called? Degree. Degree. Okay, so we've got this class of functions, odd degree functions. If we were to look at the graph of them, the, the middle, that's not really what we're concerned with right now in this discussion. If we move to the right, the y values shoot up. And if we move to the left, eventually the y values plummet down into the negatives. Because if you take a positive number to a whatever power, you get out positive numbers. But if you take a negative number to an odd power, 3, 5, 7, whatever, you start getting well, you get negatives, and eventually those negatives will be so big that they'll overpower the rest of the polynomial. Okay. <coughs> All right, so odd degree polynomial. But what about this? If I change this in the slightest way by putting a negative in front of that x cubed, do you think that would change it? How would it change it? Well, then the outcome would for positive x inputs would be, the output would be negative. Yes. So when you go this direction, we put in positive x's into this thing, but negative is, is last, right? The negative is the last thing we do here. We cube it, and it's positive. It's this big, big positive number, but then we make it negative. So now it does the opposite of what it was doing before. So when you put a, a negative in front, we start seeing this, right? Those big positive numbers that used to be positive are being made negative. And what about when you go to the left? You're going to get those positive numbers because when you cube a negative number, you get a negative number, multiply it by negative, it becomes positive. What did we make negative? It's a word that we defined before, but we haven't talked about it, I don't think, yet today. Where did we put the negative? At the beginning. Would it matter if we put the negative here? Is that the thing that's important? No. No, it's, it's about the biggest power, right? What is that number in front of the biggest power exponent? Or the biggest power? Coefficient. The leading coefficient. So we got a negative leading coefficient 
on an odd degree polynomial and look at what the ends are going to do. Any odd degree that has a negative leading coefficient will do this. Those big negative numbers, when we take them to an odd power, will be negative, but they're multiplied by the negative leading coefficient, now they're positive. And over here, they don't turn positive, they just stay negative. Negative a million to the fifth power is going to be negative whatever, huge number. And there's just nothing that these guys can do about it, even, this, even if this was a 15,000 instead of an 8. Well, then at negative 15,000, they'd be evenly matched. And then past that, this one would be bigger. Okay, so there's just nothing that they can do about it. At some point, that biggest degree, that biggest power, will take over. <coughs> now that we've done all that, and we've had this really kind of heavy discussion. Now we've got another kind of a, how, how is this polynomial function different from the ones we just talked about? Second degree. Second degree. Not a third or a fifth or a seventh or an odd one. It's a second degree. Okay. Well, if I let x become a big positive number, okay, what happens when you square a positive number? Positive. And if x is big enough, it won't really matter what these are. Right? And it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and you see that final y value just, just takes off. Okay? What about if I square a negative number? Still positive, so it's going to the negatives. Just comes back into the positives again. And we are subtracting off the value of this term, because x is negative. It's just not enough. <coughs> that x squared is still going to take away, uh, you know, take off with the value of the function overall. So there's an odd degree. Do you think it'll be the same for all even degrees? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. The thing about it is that the biggest power in this case, the biggest power in this case, is something that when you square a number, no matter if it's positive or negative, it always comes out positive. So this thing, that's the biggest deciding uh, term is always going to be positive, and therefore, at some point, when x is big enough in either direction, it takes us into the positive y values. So, if we go this direction, y is very big. If we go this direction, y is also very big in the, the positive direction. But, as we kind of talked about here, positive leading coefficients positive leading coefficient. Well, we have an even degree and a negative leading coefficient. Let me take a look at this guy right here. If I let this guy be negative, like a negative, negative 1, the x squared part, well, no matter what number you put in for x and you square it, you always get a positive. So that always positive number will get multiplied by negative, making this always negative. Okay? And if the biggest term in your, in your uh, polynomial is negative, and at some point it's just going to be so big that the other terms cannot even compete, then it'll run away in the negative direction with the value of, of the function. So when you move to the left, we'll square a number, take a number to the fourth or the sixth or the eighth or whatever, it's going to turn a positive, but then multiply it by that negative leading coefficient is negative, and likewise, as x goes to positive infinity. Okay. Now, I've taught this subject many, many times to many, many different classes. It went really well today, and I appreciate you guys participating. I could have just given you this information, right? They, it would just become a memorization game at that point. Okay, I'm just going to memorize. And it would say, which one is it? Yeah. But now, when you see it and you want to know what the end behavior is, you just say, okay, this is the biggest power. If I cube this positive, big positive number, it'll be positive, but the thing in front is negative, so it's got to go into the negatives. Okay? You can analyze it yourself. Um, if you look in your books, now we can make hummus. What's that? We can make that hummus. We can make this chart over and over because you get it. Um, what are we on? 5.2. Alright. 
So on page 339, page 339, we have, it's a little bit mixed up of this, but it's the exact same little chart. And it tells you if the degree is this and the mean is that, then the end behavior will be like this. Um, it's a nice reference, but hopefully what we've done is by taking a little more time, discussing it more in depth, we have an understanding. And you don't need chart. Right. And I, I see, just was talking about this exact concept with my calculus students, so they get, uh, you know, a, a year and, and some, well, two years on you. And uh, they're, we were talking about end behavior, and they just were like, right on. Yeah, we get it, because this and this and this, rather than, oh yeah, what? Which was it? And having to look up the chart and all that kind of stuff. They just understood it because I taught them this two years ago. So I think it's it's well worth our time. Uh, it's how we're spending our time, and we go at this rate, and I think it's, it's very much worth it. Anyway, um, there is what we call end behavior. Now I just want to go through it and uh, use symbols and stuff to talk about the exact same thing. So as x goes to infinity, right, as we move in this direction for x, then let's call it f of x. Where is it going? It's going to positive infinity. You can see it there on the graph. As x goes to negative infinity, f of x, or y, goes to negative infinity. As we move this direction, we're talking about this graph right here. As we move this direction, we're also moving down towards negative infinity. Come over here, x going to positive infinity means that f of x will go to negative infinity. It's going down for negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, y, I should say f of x, we're not used to that, f of x. Where is it going? Infinity, yeah. As we move this direction, we're also moving this direction. It's going to positive infinity. Right. If you want to finish those two up in your notes, I encourage you to. Um, there's also some homework problems that have to do with end behavior like that. So we'll leave it to that. Um, so with end behavior and the ability to plug in x's and get out y's, right? plug in x's and get out y's is how we started today's class. Uh, with that knowledge, you can draw pretty good graphs. Um, we back up to here. We found a bunch of x's and y's. Okay, it gave us a good idea of how curvy it is. We were also then able to say, well, looking at the degree and the leading coefficient, I know it's got to come back down at some point and go that direction. All right. So we're able to say for sure that it's, it's got to go down there at, at some point. And you know, it's not perfect. But it does get us pretty close. It moves us from knowing nothing to knowing quite a bit more than nothing. And if we look at our, our graphing calculator, maybe we turn that on. So we, this is kind of zoomed in on, you know, it's kind of cutting us off there and there. Let's say that we wanted to fix that. How could we bring the, the, this peak and this valley into view? Zoom out. Zoom out. But it's a, it's the x section of it isn't bad. It Make gives us a view. Value What's that? The, the y value smaller? Well, the, the y value is decided by x value smaller, like don't put in such big values for x? Um, change the equation. Okay, we could change the equation, that, that would, but we, we want to look at the graph of this equation, not with a negative. So we want to we want to leave it be that function. So just to kind of sum up, I think the x values are nice. They're, it's a good span of x values. It's just that we're not seeing all of the y's. So, what's that you're doing? Can we, yeah, can we, can we grab this part of the graph and this part of the graph and pull them down into the viewing window? And we can. 
we go into this, this button right here, it's called a window. It defines all of the maximum and minimum y and x values. You can see that x goes from negative 10 to 10. Okay, the minimum is negative 10 and the maximum is 10. You can see that here. You can count all those marks, it'd be negative 10 to 10. Now I'm going to change the y's so that we capture that whole thing. So what y should we go down to? 50. Negative 50? Okay. Why'd you pick 50? I don't know. Okay. You could probably get it. Uh, and where should we go to? Oh, 27. 27? Okay, let's take a look at that. Uh -huh. Now the negative 50 worked pretty nicely. Let's go positive. Positive 50. Can we use something to kind of inform ourselves of, of what y values we want to try and see? What the points the we are. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, 43. Right? Um, maybe we want to go that high or higher. Let's see, window. Why? I'm thinking. Um, let's see. 44. Well, 43 is, is this guy over here. We want to try and get that, but I don't know. 43 or 50 or something seems like it's got to be closer. Negative 30. So quite a bit higher. Okay. Um, we could look at the table and look at negative, uh, you know, something like negative 5. That's up at 75, so we can try going that high or a little higher, maybe uh, 100. So now we can see the shape of the whole thing. So you can see my, my graph is off. I, I should have gone up a little higher like that. But that's not right now all of that important. We'll find those places, those highest places and those lowest places later. Uh, but for now, that's a great graph. It's a fantastic graph. That's even better than I would expect. I would, I would expect a few points, maybe four, not, not seven, okay, and correct end behavior. I would like to see. <coughs> okay, so that's that's what we're going to do. So at this stage, graphing looks like get the end behavior right, and just give a few points that are correct that the graph goes through. That's all I want. It's a good starting place to be. Right. So these guys are about end behavior. Okay. Uh, and now we're, we can graph it. Right? Graphing would look a lot like what we just saw. We want to get some points that the graph goes through and get the end behavior correct. All right. Now, there's this last thing, which I think is pretty neat, and uh, it, I think it's fun to think about why it works, okay, but I'll show you how to do it. Um, here, we'll take this function right here. Take this function, we'll plug, let's say we plug 3 into it. Okay? But we'll do it with something called synthetic substitution. So it starts like this, every synthetic substitution looks, it's kind of like long division, right? Long division always has that division symbol. Uh, you set it up the same way every time. So we set it up this way, I'm going to put some numbers here, you see if you can see where I conjured those numbers from. The coefficients and then the constant. So we put the coefficients down just like they look. If we want to put 3 in there, put 3 on the outside. Bring down the 1. Always the 1 comes down. All right. And so this is just, it's set up. We're about to start doing synthetic division, or synthetic substitution. Um, and if we wanted to you know, set it up for our next one, you just change what this number is, and you start out the same way. All right, so here it goes. 3 and 1. It's like 3 times 1. And then put the result right here, got three. <coughs> and then we're just going to add these two numbers together, 11. And then we do it again, three times 11, 33. Add these together, you get 26, yeah, 26 when we add these together. Then three times 26. Seventy-eight. Yes. 
78. And then we add these together, and when we do that, we'll be done. So 78 minus 35, uh, 42. So we're sitting there like take some cubit, multiply this is a long string of calculations. So we'll just do that. And the hardest thing we had to do was you know, three times twenty-six. This is the hardest thing we had to do. Let's do it again for uh, negative three. We'll just set it up again. One, eight, negative seven, negative thirty-five, put negative three in there. It's all set up exactly the same way it was before. Three times one, negative three. Together, three, negative three times five, negative fourteen, negative twenty-two, and the three times two is sixty-six. Uh, and then add these together: sixty-six minus thirty-five is thirty-one. Two. Two back. Negative three. Thirty-one. Talk about shortcuts and the easy way out, and Wally and being a big well, toddler. Well, of course, you're going to do the Just wait here. I'll go get your hamburger and a cup. And you can just slip that. Yeah, just slip it down, buddy. Just like blending hamburger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, go ahead. Make your case. Why, why should I have just given you that to start with? Well, if you can explain why it does uh -huh. And we understand why it does this. Then same as us understanding why the other one works. Well, you would know why the other one works. Okay, I'm gonna put it as a challenge to to you guys. To anybody who's interested. Okay, and if you impress me, you'll probably get some extra credit. Okay, but I'll give you a starting point. Synthetic substitution starts the same way for everything. You set it all up, you write down the coefficients, you bring down the, the leading coefficient. By the way, you have to write these in order. Okay, make sure you write them in order. Highest degree, next degree, next degree. And if, the, if, if this 8x squared was missing, if there was no 8x squared, you need to put a zero there. Okay, so those are a couple of conditions on synthetic substitution. But for this problem, we would always put 1, 8, negative 7, and negative 35. And bring down the 1. And we can put whatever we want right there. Okay? The way we represent whatever we want in algebra is with an x. So I would say repeat the process, not with a specific number, but with x. And you'll see why it works. Let me write your homework up there. So the extra credit thing is impressive.